And then if you just want to introduce yourself and say a little bit more about your composting operation or whatever, however you want to start, yeah. go for it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, um, you know, I'm honored that you guys asked me to, to talk about compost. Um, you know, I definitely don't know everything about it, but I'm happy to share, you know, share with you guys what I do know. Um, so thanks a lot again. Um, a little bit about myself. Um, I went to school for plant and soil science, and um, I've worked um, in a couple different fields, but the last, I don't know, call it five years or so, I've been working on, you know, a farm, farming as a business. And like I said, um, I grow root vegetables, and then I also have a composting operation. Um, the root, you know, the garlic root vegetables I mostly distribute through um, food hubs throughout the uh, eastern, you know, throughout eastern Massachusetts um, to areas of the state that don't really have good access to to fresh and local produce. Um, and then the compost business, I've been composting a lot for my own farm for a number of years. Um, and but in the last, you know, year or two, I've started to compost more commercially. Um, where I try to make it available to other, um, you know, other growers, uh, both, you know, farmer type growers and, um, you know, individual type growers. So, so what I'll do is um, I'll give just an overview on what composting is and how, how it works. Um, and then I'll go through a few examples of how, you know, regular people can compost at home and um, and also what it means for, you know, for the country and for the environment. Um, and then I'll discuss, you know, what you can do with the compost once you produce it. Um, and then hopefully, um, you know, at the end, we can have a bunch of questions and answers. And since it's a relatively small group, um, I'm happy to be interrupted as I go and, you know, feel free to ask me questions. Um, I guess, Michelle, maybe you'll kind of moderate the questions or... Yeah, I think since we are a small group, if folks feel comfortable unmuting themselves, if you're asking something that you know is relevant yeah. to, to what Grisha is talking about right now, and then if you prefer, you can definitely put stuff in the chat, and I will, um, you know, wait for a pause and and bring it up. So whatever okay. you're comfortable with, they both work. Perfect. All right, sounds good. Can you guys all hear me okay, or can you at least hear me okay, Michelle? Good. Um, so so when I when I think about composting. Um, you know, it's basically the natural decomposition of anything that was once living. And, you know, that's a pretty big list. It could be like an old leather glove or, you know, that you found in your closet or, you know, the lint from your dryer, or most commonly it's, you know, it's vegetable peels from your, from your kitchen um, and it's yard waste and so forth. Um, and to me, composting is not so much like a process it's more of um it's kind of like living organisms that you're growing so if you think of a dairy farmer um you know a dairy farmer or or, or a beef farmer they're growing they're growing cows and the cows need certain things to be to be successful they need they need water they need food and they need air um, and then on top of that you just want to make them comfortable so they so they produce well. Um, so composting is just like farming an animal, except instead of a you know a large cow, you're farming you're farming microscopic bacteria and microbes. Um, so that's at you know at a high level that's how I think of composting. So you've got a little colony of these living organisms that you can't see, um, and if you treat them right and you, if you create the correct conditions, then they produce compost, just like a cow produces you know manure. Um, so, so to talk about the exact ideal conditions, you need air, just like everything else. You need water um, and you need food. So the food is what most people think about when they think of composting. Um, it's gotta be a certain mix of things that are completely dead. So that's what's called carbon. And then things that are still sort of alive, that's called nitrogen. So in composting, people oftentimes say, the carbon to nitrogen ratio. Um, so for carbon, you can do things like, um, you know, leaves, napkins, wood chips, anything that's really kind of dry and dead. 
Um, and for nitrogen, you can do things that are more sort of alive and have, you know, moisture in them and so forth. So that could be grass clippings, that could be vegetables, that could be green leaves, coffee grounds, manure, um, you know, whatever it may be. Um, and the ideal ratio of carbon to nitrogen, um, you know, realistically, it's a lot of carbon to a little bit of nitrogen, but, you know, scientifically, it's supposed to be 30 to one. So if you have a big pile of um, like dead leaves or napkins, if you add a little bit of your kitchen scraps or um, a little bit of coffee grounds or whatever, that'll create a pretty good, um, that'll create a pretty good mixture. Um, so what happens when you create that good mixture is um, you have different bacteria and microbes that typically come from the ground and they, and they eat all of this um, and they create heat and they also create water vapor and they create CO2 um, and they create this, this humus material, which is what, you know, people put in their, in their garden. Um, so I'll get into a little bit more kind of um, technical science stuff, but not too far because I know everyone it's kind of a backyard gardener. So you probably heard me say CO2, um, which is what a good, you know, a good batch of compost will produce. Um, and, you know, a lot of people think CO2 is, is not good, right, for the environment. Um, and it isn't the best. Um, but when you think of kind of the ozone layer and global warming and so forth, um, there's two different types of, um, you know, gases or emissions that come from things that decompose. Um, so if you, if something natural decomposes and it decomposes in a manner where it doesn't have, these microbes don't have oxygen, um, they produce methane. Um, so a lot of the, you know, like a, um, like a trash heap or a dump or whatever, um, those produce methane and people even capture the methane and they use it as energy. Um, and when you, when you do composting with um, the air, with oxygen, then it produces CO2. So the, the big difference between CO2 and methane when it comes to um, you know, the environment and the ozone and so forth is CO2 absorbs um, you know, when the sun is shining one unit of heat. Um, so it makes, you know, it makes the air one unit warmer. Um, methane, on the other hand, absorbs 30 units of heat. So, and that's what creates the greenhouse effect, which you guys have probably heard about. Um, so it's, it's a very fascinating way to, um, you know, sequester carbon and also to decrease global warming. Um, which I think is, you know, I think what a lot of people that garden care about. Um, so that's kind of the, the science behind it um, at a high level. And then the other thing with, with methane is it's, it's kind of hard to, it's hard to capture um, and it's hard to process. So to the, um, you know, to the extent we can reduce um, how much methane we produce, um, it's, it's something that makes a big difference. So <clears throat> I guess I'll, I'll take a quick pause there because that's probably a lot of information at once, just about kind of the basics of compost work. So I'd love to uh, answer any, any questions you guys may have about just composting in general and, and how it works. Don't all chime in at once. I'll need, I'll, need at least, I'll need at least one question before I move on. <laughs> Who's going to do it? So uh, I'm interested in hearing you say that the most effective ratio is 30 to 1, uh, because I've heard more like a, a 3 to 1. And I, maybe that's why my compost isn't composting very fast, because I have too much um, green stuff in it. Yeah. Um, well, to, to be extra technical, it's, it's 30 parts, um, 
carbon and one part nitrogen. So it depends on what you're using for both sources, because if some, like for example, um, like wood chips are, have like maybe 200, it's like 200 parts of carbon uh, because it's a really, you know, sort of concentrated form of carbon opposed to leaves, which are more, and maybe they're like 60 to one or something. So it depends on what you use as your carbon source. And then um, like ash from your, from your fireplace is like 600 parts carbon. Um, so it, it depends, but generally speaking, you want, you want to give it more food to eat, which is mostly carbon. And the nitrogen is kind of what activates the food. Um, but you can, you know, sort of experiment with it. Um, and so I'll, I'll go into the different ways of composting and that might make it a little bit more clear of, you know, how you should adjust, um, adjust your ratio. <clears throat> so let's see here. I wanted to, um, I wanted to share uh, one of my screens. Let's see if I can do that here. One second. Okay. Can you guys, um, can you guys see, it says warm bin composting. I'll take that as a yes. 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 Okay, good. Um, so <clears throat> um, there's, there's a number, there's a whole lot of different ways to, to compost. Um, and essentially, you know, it's just different mechanisms to put the, the carbon and the nitrogen together in, in a good environment. Um, so I'll start from the smaller, smallest scale and I'll go to the biggest scale. Um, so the, what, what people in, you know, that have like an apartment or a small property or a deck or something, what they can do is um, use warm bin composting. And this is like, it's, it works really well and it's super cool, but it's, you know, it's a smaller scale. Um, so the way it works is you have different bins that go from the bottom to the top and they're kind of flat and wide. Um, and they have holes inside of them. So you, you, um, you put the ratio of like, you know, kitchen scraps and newspapers or whatever into the bottom pile, you get the ratio about 30 to one. Um, and then you put the worms in and what they do is they, they eat all of the, um, material. And then once they're done eating the material in the, in the, in the bottom layer, they go up through the holes to the next, um, to the next, you know, shelf, and all that's left in the first one is, um, you know, the compost, which you can use pretty quickly right away. Um, and then what you do is you take out the bottom layer, you use it, and you put it all the way on the top, and you'll have, you know, five or six or more layers that the um, worms are just slowly going up and eating um, and digesting all of the waste. And that's something you can do like in a really small area. And you can either buy, you know, warm compost stations, or you can build it yourself with just bins and, and holes at the bottom of them. Um, and the cool thing about the, um, the warm bin composting is that the worms generally double in population in about two months. So once you get it going, it just kind of keeps going and going and going. It happens faster and more efficiently. Um, so, you know, you start it up and then it, um, it just kind of feeds off of itself. Um, and red wigglers and red worms are typically the best ones to use for, um, for worm bin composting. Um, so the, the next stage up, and it's still, you know, I'd say fairly small scale, but it's perfect for the, um, for the backyard guard, gardener or someone that lives in a, um, like a condo or a townhouse is, um, is a compost tumbler. Um, and there's, there's different designs. Um, this one that's on my picture, it's a two, a two bin system. So basically you get, um, you get the, the food in there and you can put some water in there depends, uh, depending on how dry it is. Um, and then you introduce oxygen to it by tumbling it, you know, once a day or once every couple of days. Um, and this is great for, you know, just you're getting rid of everything you have in your kitchen um, and maybe a little bit of yard waste if you have a small yard or your newspapers or, 
you know, napkins from dinner. Like you can compost pretty much everything. Um, and the reason it has two sections of the tumbler is because once one fills up, you want to let it just kind of finish by keeping it turning um, and not adding anything new to it. Um, and then you can start, you know, your next batch in the, in the second section. So, you know, depending on how much you produce, maybe one of those bins is enough. Maybe you have two of those bins. Um, just depends on how much you want to do. Um, and it generally, like whatever you put in there or any kind of compost you do, it generally reduces in volume by half. So, you know, you can fill it up and then at the end, you'll have half of it full of, of actual compost, which is kind of nice in terms of, um, you know, again, keeping um, organic thing, organic matter out of our landfills and, and reducing um, methane gas and so forth in our, in our atmosphere. Um, and, you know, this one is obviously like a fancy one that's specifically made for, for compost, um, but you can also just use an old trash can um, and, you know, drill a few holes in the side of it and then just fill it up. That's actually what I do. I have a couple of cans um, and I put the waste in from, you know, from dinner and then I add some leaves to it and then it just kind of keeps taking it in and eventually I stop and let it finish and then I use it on my garden. Um, so that's a nice thing to do at home. <clears throat> And it also keeps, it keeps pests out. So some people have um, concerns of like raccoons or squirrels or whatnot. Um, so if you have a nice bin, whether it's custom for compost or just the old trash can that's covered, um, it generally keeps all the pests out. So the next, the next one is, I would say more for like a, you know, like a homesteader or someone that has, I would probably guess, you know, maybe half an acre or more of land. Um, is what's called a three bin system. And there's different ways to design it, um, but this is one that was designed with pallets. So, um, you know, you, you make a pile in the first one and once it's full, you keep kind of turning it every couple of days. Once it's full, you move it to the second section um, and then you start a new pile and then you keep turning both of them. And then eventually, once it gets to the third section, it's pretty much finished compost. Um, so this 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 is a little bit more involved. You know, this means you need a like a shovel or a pitchfork and maybe a wheelbarrow, um, and you can produce a pretty good amount of compost. And you can make it a four bin system or a five bin system, depends how you know how big you want to go. Um, and again, these these reduce in volume by a lot. So once you get them going. Um, you can, uh, you can fit a lot in there, especially once the microbes get active and so forth. Um, so the, uh, this, is the, this is what's called windrow composting. And windrow composting is how, um, you know, commercial groups uh, that produce, you know, the, the bags of compost that you buy at the, um, you know, the hardware store, this is how they make compost. So they get all of the material and it can be the same type of material that people do at home and they mix it up to the right ratio, you know, 30 to one typically. Um, and they spread it out in these windrows, which are like just long rows that are maybe 10 feet wide and, and six feet high. Um, and they'll, they'll monitor the heat um, and they'll monitor the water. And then they'll use various, you know, mechanical implements um, to, to introduce oxygen into the piles. So what happens if you let a pile sit, um, just like a, you know, any pile, whether it's in your backyard or at a, at a farm, eventually the microbes run out of oxygen that are inside the pile. So different companies use different technology. This one, I don't know if you can see it, but they use this big um, auger that's connected to the tractor that spins sort of underneath the pile. Uh, and it turns it over and introduces a bunch of oxygen so the microbes can keep breathing. And if you see um, the bigger piles of compost, if they're you know three to six feet high, they can heat up a lot. So these piles, um, you can see, produce a lot of steam and heat. Um, so if you if you have if you have some space in your yard and you can build a pile that's you know four to five or six feet big, 
um, you can go out and get a, a thermometer, a compost thermometer, um, and you can measure the pile. It's, it's amazing to see just the pile of waste um, in the middle of winter that's, you know, 120, 130 degrees. I think it's, I think it's pretty cool. Um, so I guess I went kind of quick there, but those are the different, different types of composting. You know, again, um, you can compost even just in your kitchen with a warm bin. You can compost on your deck or in a small yard with a compost tumbler. And you can use a, you know, three or four bin system um, with, you know, if you have a little bit of a bigger yard and, and if you become a, a commercial composter, you can get a big tractor and, and do windrow composting. Um, the way, the way I do it I'm on my farm is I set up um, perforated pipes underneath the, um, underneath the piles. And so instead of using, um, you know, a big tractor with a machine that, to introduce oxygen, I use a solar powered fan that blows air through the pipes um, and introduces oxygen without having to use, you know, diesel fuel and fossil fuels to, uh, to create the compost. So it just kind of accelerates the natural process by using the power of the sun to um, blow some air into the piles, which, is, which I think is also pretty cool. Um, and the reason why, well, it heats up for a number of reasons. One is because, um, you know, all of the organisms are just working hard and they're producing, they're basically sweating um, and they produce a lot of heat and water. Um, and the benefit of that is that any, any sort of pathogens or, you know, weed seeds or any sort of disease or, you know, mold or anything uh, that may be in there, um, they, they go away because of this heat. They just get killed, which is nice. So you can produce a really clean, healthy compost. Um, so an interesting, I'll show you one more picture. An interesting way to test compost um, is what's called the radish test. Um, well this, I took this picture with my phone, so it didn't really come out great, but this is a test that I did on my compost that I produced. Um, what you do is you take you know, a couple pots. I used uh, an egg crate. Um, and you put in uh, four radish seeds in each pod, um, and then you water it. And radishes are used because they're, they tend to germinate very quickly. So if you can get at least three out of four radish seeds to germinate in your compost, that means it's a good product that you can use. So when you guys are composting at home and you're wondering, well, is my compost ready? Is it good to go? Um, this is the test you can do is, is what's called the radish test. Just get a little packet of radish seeds. Uh, you put, you know, put four in each one, and uh, if it comes up in a couple of days, then then you're good to go. Um, and you can also see if other weeds come up. You'll know if your if your compost has weed seeds in it. Um, the other the other interesting thing about compost is that when it's done, it has a neutral pH. So that's a kind of a common question that comes up. Um, you know what the pH is of, of your compost, whether it's acidic or or not. Um, so yeah, I'll pause there again, I guess. And if you guys want to have any questions on the types of um, the types of composting methods. Um, yes, we have, have a question in the chat. Um, oh yeah, here we go. Here we go. A couple of them. So somebody was asking about where to get. Um, composting worms. Perfect. Yep. Okay. I'll, I'll, I see the questions now. I'll start with the first one. What composting system would you recommend for a two-person household? Um, so for, for a two-person household, if you have outdoor space, like a backyard or a deck, I would definitely recommend um, the tumbler, whether it's a tumbler you buy, you know, online or, or one that you make yourself. Um, again, to make one yourself, you get a trash can, you drill a bunch of holes in it, and you kind of roll it around or shake it up every couple of days to introduce oxygen, and you keep it, you know, somewhat moist. Um, and then if you have, um, if you're a two-person household and you don't have access to like a, you know, a porch or a balcony or a yard, then I would recommend the, um, the warm bin composting, which can be quite small. Um, and I guess that, that'll go into the next question, which is how do you get the worms into the compost bin? 
do you buy your own worms? Um, so yeah, you would buy your own worms. Um, again, the, the good worms to use for, for composting um, are red wigglers and red worms. And you can, you can order them online. Um, you can probably start with, I don't know, like maybe half a pound of worms, depending on the size or even less, because again, they, they just reproduce every, um, every two months or so. Um, you can also go to like a fishing, fishing supply store or any kind of outdoor store that, that deals with fishing, they'll typically have worms or they can order the right worms for you. Um, that's a good question. What's a good way to compost materials in the winter? Do I just pile it up outside and add to compost in spring? Um, so if you have a smaller, if you have a smaller compost setup, um, you can just keep going. You know, you can just keep doing it in the winter. You don't have to create a separate pile. Um, it'll go slower because it doesn't have as much heat, but um, if it's at least the size of a trash can, it, it probably won't freeze because it's just, they're living organisms and they keep going as long as you feed them. Um, so I wouldn't pile it up outside. I would, I would add it to the composter constantly. Another question, wood chips, are you buying those? If so, where? Um, wood chips to me are like a free commodity. Um, you can generally get, it well, depends how much you want, but if you want a little bit, if you want like a little bit of wood chips, like a few buckets, you can usually go to your like local town yard where they do, you know, the, wherever they store the trucks for plowing and sanding and whatever and doing work. They'll usually have a big pile of wood chips that they're happy to give to you or that if you want to just put them in your truck or in your car. Um, if you if you want to have a lot of wood chips, um, then you can call your local tree company that does you know tree work in your neighborhood um, and just ask them to drop you off a dump truck of wood chips. Um, so wood chips um, are definitely you know what I consider a free commodity. Um, and they're nice to use, like unrelated to compost, they're nice to use in the yard because you can fill in low spots or you can build paths. And, um, you know, it's a good material because eventually it turns into soil and there's no rocks in it. Um, uh, so yeah, I use wood chips a lot myself. Um, I wouldn't pay for them though. You can get them for free. I have a question to ask verbally when you have a chance to read community garden composting. Okay, Elizabeth Simmons, you're up. Hey. Um, so I'm in a community garden and it has a three bin system. I, I put that in quotes because it's never really been used. Everyone just crams all their weeds and like pruning stuff into all three bins. And it's it's been like that for the three years that I've been gardening and nothing ever breaks down. We're always just yeah. cramming stuff down in there. And um, obviously that's not it's not working for its intended purpose. I think one of the problems is we have, it's in Somerville and we have a lot of rat, a big rat problem. So nobody can really put food product in there. Um, so I'm not sure, I'm not sure how we can get it to break down enough to ever, I like, I don't even know that we care about it being usable compost, but just to like break down the matter in its volume, like that, just to decay to let it decay to some degree would be great but I don't know how to make that happen um <laughs> just yeah the bins are closed too like the one the picture you showed they were open and ours are closed because of the rats like yes so you can't really turn them easily or <laughs> I don't really know what the city had in mind when they made the three bins do you have do you have a way of opening them on occasion well the top's open but you I would have to like we'd have to dismantle the front like to yeah. get it open like which could maybe be done with hinges or something like I'd have to modify them mm -hmm. I mean, they're ancient so it wouldn't be that hard to pull them apart at this yeah. point I mean typically you know those bins are compost uh, I mean sorry pallets are another common commodity that you can get for free to build those types of things um but to so you can either continue using the, the three bin system that they have there. Uh -huh. um, but you have to be a little bit more active. Maybe everyone takes a turn turning it. Like if 
I'm guessing you have a good amount of people there. If everyone That's takes like, yeah, how many? Twenty. Yeah. So, so if everyone turns it once per season, yeah, you know, then it'll be great compost. But just once, you know. So you take a pitchfork or or a shovel and just rough it up or move it from one pile to the, you know, from one section to the other. Mm -hmm. If you do it 20 times, it'll be, it'll be great compost in like two months, you know, um, but you have to have kind of some coordination and maybe some instructions that say like a little sign out sheet that says, you know, I turned it on, on March 25th and next turn date is, you know, April 1st and whoever does it just puts their name and say it's done. That would be kind of, that's probably how I would do it, but that's assuming you can, you can get access to it with a hinge or whatever. Uh, because piling it up over time, just it's a very slow process. Yeah, it's um, like super glacially slow. <laughs> yeah, I mean the other thing, this would be a different approach, but I think in terms of your question on how, how to actually process the stuff and get rid of it, um, yeah. is what a lot of people do is they'll dig um, like a little trench um, by their you know growing beds, and they'll just bury they'll bury whatever they want to get rid of. Um, so if everyone instead of using the, the bins, just has a little trench in their garden plot that they uh -huh. bury any sort of weeds in, they'll, they'll decompose that way as well. Yeah, um, actually, that's a great idea. I like yeah. that a lot, yeah. And you can, and you can do that, you can do that um, like with your, you know, kitchen waste as well. You can just bury it um, and it decomposes pretty well. But, you know, if you have, if you have animals that smell it or something, they might dig it up. The rats, yeah, there's a lot of construction now, so there is a big rat problem. So that's mm. what I'm talking about, yeah. But um, Yeah, in that so case, you probably want some like chicken wire or something that encapsulates it. So, um, you know, rats can't get into it. Can I add a couple things on community garden compost? Because we have, this yeah. is obviously something I'm familiar with. So um, there's a couple things. One is signage to make sure that people understand which bin they're supposed to be adding to. Um, and that's like, you can eat signs that you can easily move to say like, add here, take from yeah. here. Um, I think it's imperative that you get those fronts, like cut those fronts open and hinge them because if you can't yeah. turn it, it's not going to work. And, um, also some gardens will put like, uh, shears or clippers in a plastic bag and like hang them close to the compost. Cause people are usually putting in like tomato vines and huge weeds at the end of the year and stuff like that and that is difficult to have it break down you know it's just it's harder to turn so if it can be cut that helps and then usually there's a, too much carbon and not enough nitrogen in those piles because it's a lot of like dead plant matter at the end of the season so if you can um you know think about adding coffee grounds or something like that to help heat it up um, yeah that can oh, help yeah I can supply yeah. them in grounds on my own <laughs> you could, <laughs> there you, you go could also uh, i guess a, a way to sort of outsource it also if you have a lot of it building up is you could partner with a um like a composting company that picks up um you know food waste and have a can there you know and they just pick it up sure. give you a new can and you don't have to worry about the you know the rats and you don't have to worry about doing it yourself um it's a different solution but i think people enjoy some composting well, yeah, and one thing that I also wondered about is there's so many um, weeds in there that if we're composting the weeds and they're not getting, they're not gonna probably get that hot because it's not huge, like the piles. Right. Like, aren't we gonna just be perpetuating the weeds or diseased plant matter as well? Yes. Like that's what people are discarding. Like how, how do you get it to heat up <laughs> enough? Or can you? you have I guess the, the short answer is that you have to have a big enough pile where, yeah, yeah. you know, any little heat that's produced doesn't dissipate out immediately. It kind of gets trapped in. So the pile's got to be at least, you know, four or five feet high. Oh, yeah. I think ours is probably about four feet high. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's possible. You just have to, the limiting factor pretty much always in every situation is oxygen. So if you just leave it be there, you know, imagine, imagine a person or an animal is like inside of something, eventually they'll run out of oxygen. So um, that's, that's why at the beginning of my, of my, of the call, I just, I made a point of, I think of thinking about it as if you're growing an animal, right. you know? Um, so if, 
if an animal is under a pile of compost, eventually they'll pretty quickly run out of oxygen. Um, right. So that's that's the limiting factor typically. So if you have twenty, if you have someone that turns it twenty times a season, uh -huh. you'll have plenty of oxygen. But um, if you're not staying on top of the oxygen, it'll just it'll slow down and it, it'll, it won't heat up. You know. Yeah. Um, and that's what we use those tubes for. You, and you're in yours. You put in. Oh yeah. Yep. So I have I have these pipes um, that have a timer with a fan and the fan blows air into it every hour or so. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank um, you. That's really. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's see. The next question is how long should it take to produce compost in a tumbler? The company I bought it from claimed it can be finished in three weeks, but it took me all winter to get finished compost. Um, so that kind of goes, goes along the, um, the heat question is in the winter, um, you know, obviously if the temperature is colder, it's going to be slower. And the fact that you got it done um, throughout the winter is pretty good um, considering that it's freezing outside. Um, but yeah, I'd say, I'd say three plus months realistically is, is how long it could take to, to make some compost if you stay on top of it, you know. Um, so if you kind of get, if you use all of your, all of your waste um, in the summer, and let's say into the fall, and then you stop adding to it. Um, hopefully by the spring, when you plant again, you, you'll have compost. But yeah, it, it takes it does take some time. Um, but if you do nothing, it'll also compost, but it'll just take you know at least twice as long. <clears throat> and do you need to screen the finished compost? Um, it depends. You know, it depends on if you're if you're adding the compost to like a flower pot in your living room and you want it to be really fine, then it maybe makes sense to screen it so you don't have any like twigs or pieces of leaves or eggshells or something. Um, but if you're adding it to your to a garden bed outdoors, then I wouldn't bother screening it, but it's kind of a personal preference. Um, put small amounts of kitchen scraps directly into garden soil will hurt plant or not. Um, no, it won't hurt the plants. And, you know, typically you would do it um, kind of underneath the paths where you walk, not, you know, like not right directly, you know, adjacent to um, the actual garden. <clears throat> so another, another point on unfinished compost, um, it should be kind of dark you know, dark brown and a little bit moist. Um, and if you take a handful of it and squeeze it, you should have one or two drops um, come out. And that's another way to know that your compost like is, in, is finished and in pretty good shape. Um, and it's good for, you know, it's good for your garden. It's good for your lawn. It's good for flower beds. Um, it's actually also good for animal bedding. If you have like um, a horse or a pony or something. Um, and it basically eliminates the, uh, the need for any sort of chemical fertilizers, um, which is nice. And you know the way I think about it is, um, it's a really good way to sequester carbon and to lower your carbon footprint um, and to have the food we eat and you know, the waste that we produce um, be in a circular pattern. Uh, because once you, once you go into a landfill, um you kind of you cut off the the circle of life if you will um <clears throat> and you know once you start producing the methane it's hard to sequester the methane so that's where um the greenhouse gases go up <clears throat> so I, I think it's a really cool way to you know to help um to help the environment to help the country um so a little a little fact uh each person in the u.s wastes about one food, one pound of food every day, uh, which is about hundred million tons per year. So if, if all of us can, um, you know, take at least, you know, some food every day that we would normally waste and, and take it out of the waste stream, um, we can contribute, contribute to reducing, you know, almost hundred million tons of food per year. And right now there's about 6% of food waste is, is composted in the US. Um, which is pretty low.
Let's see another question here. <clears throat> a suggestion for Elizabeth Dark Community Garden to build an improvement system with slides on the front, which makes moving the compost easy. Yeah. Is it okay to put dog waste in garden soil? Um, no, I would not. I would I would stay away from um, cat or dog waste because they, they tend to have um, different types of bacteria that can be can be hazardous. So yeah, stay away from that. Um, so I'll, I'll give you one more fact, which is kind of interesting, sad, but interesting. Um, if, if food waste was a country, um, it would be the third largest greenhouse gas emitter after the US and China. So a lot of um, greenhouse gas is produced from, from food waste. That's not, obviously not composted. Um, how do you wrap food through compost? Is chicken wire enough? Um, yeah, I mean, the fine chicken wire, that's maybe like an inch or less, right? They're not gonna get through that. Um, so yeah, I would say that's enough. Or you can use, um, you know, wood, like pressure treated wood. Hardware cloth is really nice if you also have like mice and voles, if you're trying to keep smaller rodents out. So that's that hard, half inch mesh metal. It's like square. Mm. Um, it's a little bit more, it's a lot more expensive than chicken wire, but it lasts for a long time. <clears throat> yep. Any other any other thoughts, questions? You guys are generally pretty quiet today. Everyone must be eager to get into their garden. I mean, I would second the Tumblr recommendation. I love my Tumblr. I got a big yeah. old, it was used, it was, I can't remember what it's called, Earth Machine or something. It was very expensive new, but I got it used and it's held up really well. And um, I live in a pretty dense neighborhood. So a open pile or something like that would, and with like pretty conventional neighbors. So I'm the only one with like lots of plants and compost. And I think that really helps make people not hate us <laughs> yeah i i think i think the tumblr is probably for most people that aren't farmers i think um the compost tumblr is the best solution because you can just have it right next to your trash cans you know so you have one can for food waste one can for recycling and one can for trash and when you go out there you just kind of know which which spot to go into um and it's very contained so you don't have to worry about um, you know, on you know, unsightly um, appearance or animal animals trying to get in there, or whatever. So that's definitely a good one, um, and it can it can accommodate a good amount of a good amount of waste um, from any regular sized household. Lots of folks suggest things like adding coffee grounds or ground eggshells directly to the garden soil. Do you think this is a good idea, or should it be composted? Um, so I would, I would prefer to compost it um, because anything that's that uh, fresh um, or that dead, like eggshells are very, are like very dead. Um, they would be definitely a carbon source. They take a long time to break down and um, coffee grounds are very fresh. So they're a, a great source of nitrogen. Um, so, it, it, you know, with just eggshells, it would just take forever to get anything out of them for your garden. And with just um, coffee grounds, it would be kind of too hot, like it would burn it. Um, so you, you would wanna compost both of those. And, and coffee grounds are great because they're already so finely milled that it takes them less time to, to get compost because they have more surface area. Let's check out the tumbler that Michelle has. So the only thing about the tumblers like this one is that it's just one 
chamber. So I have to stop adding and let yeah. it finish. And I just pile stuff up in buckets for a couple of weeks and then, and then let it like age in my yard out of the tumblers. Yeah. It works, but some of them are two chambered. Oh. Yeah, I guess you can get, if you want, you can get two of them. Yeah, if you don't want to spend, if you want to spend $900. Yeah, that's, <laughs> but, that's yeah, extreme. I, that's it's, extreme that's for an expensive a, one. Yeah. Uh, but it's super good quality. It was five years old when I got it and it's, I've had it wow. for seven years and it's still going, so. That's amazing. I just a can on little wheels and yeah, I it's like so that. nice. I I'd never t turn compost enough if it's on if I if I don't have a tumbler. <laughs> like right. Always putting it off. So yeah, you can basically it turn it every day. Yeah. Very cool. <clears throat> Actually, I have a question. Um, yeah. So I have seen that like some of the compost services and stuff will say to put dryer lint in them, but. And you mentioned that, but isn't it yeah. like a lot of plastic with what we, you know, fleece clothes and yeah, yeah. I mean, um, you know, if you have, if you're, if you're talking about cotton or wool, then like you're totally good to go. Uh, but then when you get into things like yeah, spandex or or fleece or whatever, um, it's not compostable. It's really actually not good for the environment, but. Um, it's just another thing that, generally speaking, can be composted. Um, but like if you have an old leather belt or like an old wool sweater, you could toss it into your compost pile. Now, one other thing that I put in that, I mean, I have a very hairy dog. This may not be relevant for everyone, but it was nice <laughs> for me to learn that pet hair was something that could compost. Yeah, so absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Brewer's grains is like a common composting ingredient as well. Um, yeah, any, again, anything that was once alive um, can be composted pretty well. And the, the, the biggest thing that I like about it is just, it's a really cool way for you to make, for everyone to make like a personal difference in, in our immediate environment and the entire world's environment. Cat fur tumbleweeds, absolutely. Yeah, I have some of those too. We have a cat and a dog, and every time they they try to play together, there's just a big pile of hair left. What do you think, Michelle? Any any closing comments? Oh, uh, well, actually, you know, what? I'll see if I can grab it quickly. No need to hang out, folks, if you don't want to. But I have a picture of a of a female system at a community garden. Actually, didn't someone say they were at a Charlestown community garden? It might actually be at your garden, um, which is pretty cool. Um, it, it all like it opens. It's all made of hardware cloth and then it opens. Um, let me see if I can find it without spending too much time. I know it's in one of my composting presentations, but where? No problem. Well, it's, um, when is the best time to spread the compost to garden is a good time or too early? Um, well, it's, you know, it's never a bad time, but I would say the best time um, is right before you uh, plant something, because that way all of the nutrients that are in the compost can be available to your crops. So I would say early spring, you can incorporate, if you have a garden, you can incorporate it into the soil. Um, so you put, you know, at least an inch, maybe more on top, and then you just kind of rough it into the, into the soil and that's a good time to do it. Um, so now it's definitely, it's not too early. Now it's a good time, yeah. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm available. I think you, you guys, maybe you can share my contact details, Michelle. Um, if anybody wants to chat about, um, you know, gardening or composting or farming or anything like that, I'm happy to, to talk with people. Rat proof screened bin. Yeah, so this is yeah. the thing I was talking about. It's, um, oh no, why do you do that? Don't go back to the first slide. Okay, so you can see that's hardware cloth, which is that half inch metal mesh. Uh -huh. um, and then 
both they, they just have a regular lid over the top, which probably since this is out in the sun helps it stay a little moist and a little cooler. Um, and then here it's like, you can see that the top comes off and nice. the front comes off. So it's super easy to turn. So if you really want this to be rat proof, you know, the bottom has to be lined also because they'll totally burrow in and, and nest in there. But if it is, um, you know, that works and you can see they're nice and big. I mean, it's, they're processing a lot of waste here and you can see that people are still putting in like really huge fines and it's probably taking a long time. But anyway, it's a, it's a cool bin. And if anyone is in the city and wants to look at another one, um, the West Springfield Community Garden in the South End on West Springfield Street has a really nice bin also, um, like a compost bin <laughs> connoisseur. Like that one is great. Uh, but it's locked a lot of the time, but if anyone's in there, they'd let you in there. So there's some cool like homemade options. Um, another, another question here. Um, is it possible to add too much compost to a garden? No, it's really not. It's just like a, you know, just like a really high quality soil at the end of the day. So you can't go, you can't go overboard with compost. A lot of the community gardens do have um, levels of phosphorus that are a little through the roof because they've been adding compost for so many years and that won't hurt your plants, but it's actually not great for the groundwater. So if you do a soil test, like keep an eye on that. Um, and you know, it doesn't mean you shouldn't add compost, but it maybe means you should be careful about what kind of fertilizer you use if you're also fertilizing or just, you know, something to keep a little bit of an eye on. Um, yeah, it's, um, most compost is pretty low on, on phosphorus, so. Um, um, that's not true for the city compost and what our soil tests show. It's definitely, really? they're all, they're way above optimum. Yeah, and uh, it is considered like, um it can be an issue yeah um, I guess it, maybe it depends on what's the what the ingredients are yeah they're pretty these are it's like the stuff that the gardens get is pretty leafy um mm -hmm. it's like yard waste compost for the most part i think yeah. so i'm not sure what exactly is leading to it but it definitely tests really high mm. um you know i think in general compost is good but it's not the same thing as soil and sometimes people are just growing like purely in it and really like i think having some mineral basis for your soil is also yeah important so like a loam mix like if you're starting out you know starting out right depends on what you're starting with yeah um cool well we do have more time but i think we're sort of reaching a natural stepping point yeah did you have anything else you wanted to add um I don't think so. You know, I, I hope that I hope that people, um, you know, come away with a little bit of a higher desire to compost. And um, you know, like I said, it's someone. It's something that everyone can make a difference by doing. Um, and and again, I'm I'm very much available if people want to talk about it um, after this meeting and have other questions that come up. Um, happy to discuss. Maybe I'll just um, put your email. Oh, actually, do sure. you mind putting whatever your preferred contact is in the chat? Oh, yeah, sure. Then I'm not seeing it. Now. Thank you. That's my website um, and my email. Oh, nice. Great. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Thanks, Emma. <laughs> That's really funny. <laughs> um, <laughs> All right, everybody. Thanks for your questions. Thanks for participating. Oh, I have one more question, Gusha. Do you mind um, sending that document? We're kind of collating everybody's resources into a folder to share with folks, if you feel like sharing the, Which the one? pictures. The pictures and stuff that you were showing us. Oh, yeah. Sure. Um, just email it to yeah. me or Annabelle and, and we'll put it in the folder. Absolutely. And thank you again. Happy yeah, my growing season. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. Bye, everybody. <laughs>